I want to thank uh, David and, and the meeting organizers for inviting me here. I'm very excited to share our, our work with all of you. Uh, so as David uh, mentioned, this is that he and I share our love of the kidney, and I'm going to be talking to you today um, about our work with the, the kidney clock. So the kidney is the organ in our body that is largely responsible for controlling pH and electrolyte balance. It is very critical for the control of blood pressure and overall homeostasis. So over here on the left is a bisected human kidney. It has an outer region we call the cortex and an inner region called the medulla. The kidneys filter 180 liters of blood per day. And so um, because the kidney is so efficient, it uses its functional uh, unit here, the nephron, which is pictured over here on the right, and it reabsorbs 99% of that filtrate, and that's lucky for us. That means we give out a concentrated urine volume of about one and a half to two liters, which is much better than 180 liters, otherwise we'd all be queuing down the hall all day. Um, so the, the nephron is divided um, into several segments, and one of my favorite jokes about the nephron is that it must have been designed by committee. Um, but each of these segments has a specialized function, and so I'll just briefly um, take you through this nephron anatomy. So the filtrate, oops, sorry. The filtrate enters at the glomerulus, travels through the proximal tubule, down into the loop of Henle, through the distal convoluted tubule, the connecting segment, and finally into the collecting duct. Our interest is uh, primarily in the area of sodium transport, and as the kidney uh, regulates sodium transport, that affects blood volume and blood pressure. So my outline today, first I'm going to describe for you the evidence that strongly suggests that renal function is rhythmic. And I also want to talk about why you should care about that. And then I'm going to go into the physiology of renal rhythms, and I've pulled out just a couple of snapshots of data that I think help describe um, the molecular underpinnings of why renal function is rhythmic. And so I'll talk specifically about a couple of clock target genes in the kidney. I'll also talk about the pathophysiology of renal rhythms, or as I like to think of it, when clock genes go bad. So evidence suggesting that renal function is rhythmic has actually been around for quite a while. And here I've summarized some clinical studies that were done going back several decades, if not longer. So these studies do come from uh, human experiments that were done looking at renal function. And in each of these graphs that I've redrawn, we're looking at here urinary sodium, blood pressure, or urinary potassium excretion on the y-axis, and then a typical 24-hour day on the x-axis. And so urinary sodium uh, varies with this circadian pattern, so does blood pressure, and also urinary potassium excretion. So why is this important? Well, let me go back just one moment and talk about how these rhythms persist under constant conditions. So it is tempting to speculate that perhaps these rhythms in uh, renal function correspond to our sleep-wake cycle. In this study that was done uh, by Martin Moreed back in the 1970s, they subjected um, these study subjects to constant conditions. So these people were kept in a constant um, reclined position. They were given constant liquid nutrition supplements every three hours and um, they were under this, again, constant bed rest. So the experiments were done under constant dim light as well, so there were no light cues, no time cues, and food cues were kept constant. And even under these conditions, these rhythms in urinary potassium excretion persist. So it's one subject here and one subject in the, in the lower panel, and several days, going out six days here, they must have had a nice um, treat for them to participate in such a study. And you can see that this rhythmic pattern, again, it's very consistent and it persists across these um, experimental days. So in terms of why we should care about this, um, we can think about whether or not a broken clock leads to a sick or an unhappy kidney here, and there is evidence to suggest this. So in a couple of epidemiological studies, short sleep uh, in shift workers, it was the combination of these, so performing shift work outside of our normal light-dark cycle, uh, and also not getting enough sleep was strongly associated with chronic kidney disease and decreased glomerular filtration rate. 
But the opposite is true as well, and although there is less data to support this connection, I think it falls nicely in line with some of the work that uh, my colleagues showed here today. So it's also been demonstrated that in dialysis populations, so these are patients that have to undergo um, hemodialysis because they're in kidney failure, and they're known to have um, very prevalent sleep disorders. So it may also be true that a sick or unhappy kidney can lead to a dysfunctional clock. And you can imagine under this situation that you might have a downward spiral. And this is a nice illustration of how that might occur. So uh, we've illustrated today, several of us, that blood pressure has this circadian rhythm where it dips at night while we sleep. And we know um, from extensive clinical work that's been done that patients that don't undergo that dip in blood pressure, we call them non-dippers, have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke. And you can see the outcome here in this study that was done in patients undergoing dialysis in this Kaplan-Meier survival curve, cumulative cardiovascular survival here on the y-axis and this follow-up period here on the x-axis. The dippers uh, who have that normal circadian rhythm of blood pressure have much better survival. And you can see this dramatic difference here in the non-dippers. So this, again, illustrates the importance of these um, circadian rhythms in cardiovascular function. So my colleagues this morning um, have illustrated nicely for you the transcriptional mechanism of the clock. And for anyone who came in late, I'll just briefly review here that these core clock proteins, BMOL and clock, um, transcribe and activate other clock genes, including period and cryptochrome. And these transcription factors function in a series of feedback loops that also involve nuclear receptors. One of my favorite things about the clock is just how old it is, and I think it's always a powerful illustration of how important a physiological process is to go back and see how well conserved it is. And so I've illustrated that for you here, where I want to compare between bread mold and humans, flies and humans, and mice and humans, and we'll look at the amino acid level, the percent similarity in these core clock proteins. So this is relative to the human protein, the BMOL protein, which in bread mold, its ortholog is WC1, has 32% conservation to the human protein. And again, high level in Drosophila and a very high level of conservation in mouse. This is true for clock and its orthologs, for the cryptochrome proteins as well in the higher organisms, and also the period proteins. So I think, again, this illustrates just how important this is as a fundamental um, homeostatic mechanism. And in another one of my favorite papers related to the kidney, Dr. John Hoganesh did a large, unbiased transcriptomic study. And in this paper that was published a couple of years ago now in PNAS, Dr. Hoganesh and colleagues took a lot of wild-type male C57 black six mice, and they had them um, under constant conditions in total darkness, and they isolated tissues from those mice every two hours over a 48-hour period. So he literally had three shifts of people working in the laboratory to collect and process those tissues. And then he took those tissues and subjected them not only to microarray analysis, but also RNA-seq analysis. So this is a very powerful transcriptomics work with uh, very nice time resolution. And so the, the figure that I'm showing you here shows the number of circadian genes detected in a given tissue here on the y-axis with the uh, false discovery rate cut off here on the x-axis. And my favorite tissue, the kidney, is second only to the liver in terms of the absolute number of oscillating genes. And some of the other tissues you've heard about today, particularly um, the heart, are also high up on this list. So when you consider all of these tissues together, uh, Dr. Hoganesh and colleagues found that nearly 50% of all expressed genes are subject to this mechanism of regulation. And so we've taken um, a closer look at some of this regulation. So one of the um, figures that you can derive from Dr. Hoganesh's database is shown here. This is just a representative gene expression graph. Gene expression um, relative values on the y-axis and time in hours on the x-axis. The rest phase is indicated by the white bars and the active phase by the gray bars. 
a noon time point, just to orient you here, indicated with the green arrows, and the midnight time point um, during the active phase of the mice, indicated here with these black arrows. So I'm going to show you a couple of different graphs that look just like that. So in collaboration with Dr. Hoganesh, again, we've done the uh, pathway analysis of his work in the kidney. And this is uh, a, lot, a lot to look at here, but it's looking at a number of different pathways, and I just want to focus in a little bit on one that peaks down here um, at the transition from the rest phase to the active phase, and that is a family of genes uh, that function in transmembrane transport. And as I alluded to, the kidney is very important in maintaining pH and electrolyte balance, and it does that through the function of numerous specialized transporters all along the length of the nephron. And so if we look here, these genes um, that are listed, their expression, which is on the y-axis, correlates with time on the x-axis. And I just want to draw your attention here to the gene SLC9A3. It stands for solute carrier, but those of us in the renal physiology field know this as NHE3. This is the sodium hydrogen exchanger. It's highly expressed in the proximal tubule, and it's very important, given its exchange of protons for sodium ions, it's important not only in pH balance, but also in sodium homeostasis. And knockout models where they have deleted the NHE3 gene do have a blood pressure phenotype. So we've taken, again, a closer look at these data. Um, this is the NHE3 expression from Dr. Hoganesh's database, and you can see here that it has this very nice rhythm. And you can also see, related to the point that Dr. Pollock made earlier this morning, um, this expression here is a moving target. So that you can imagine if your student or your postdoc is more of a morning lark um, and they're looking at expression in the tissue and they come in early in the morning, they might get one value compared to somebody who likes to work later at night. So something to keep in mind in terms of how we plan our animal studies. So I've just scooted that graph over here to the left, and I've illustrated the time um, of midnight and noon. And if you look at Dr. Hoganesh's data, this is about a 25% difference between the peak and the trough. Now in my lab, in an independent set of animals, we isolated kidney tissues from wild-type mice at midnight and at noon. And we used real-time PCR to measure the relative mRNA expression of NHE3, nicely correlating with Dr. Hoganesh's data from a completely different experiment, we see about a 30% difference in these two time points. Earlier than this, we had taken a candidate gene approach, and we asked the question of whether or not NHE3 was regulated by the core clock protein PIR1, and that is a focus of my laboratory, and I'll tell you later why that is. Um, but we used a model of the human proximal tubule here, these human HK2 proximal tubule cells, and we knocked PIR1 down using siRNA, and you can see here that it was very effective, about an 80% knockdown. And this corresponded to about a 75% decrease in NHE3 mRNA. So one of the reasons that we got interested in PIR1 was because we identified it years ago in an unbiased transcriptomic study as a novel target gene of the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone is a mineralocorticoid hormone that regulates sodium balance and blood pressure, and we found that it acutely upregulates PIR1. Aldosterone also regulates the alpha subunit of the epithelial sodium channel, or ENAC, which is another sodium transporter in the kidney that affects blood pressure. Now, we looked at the promoter of the alpha ENAC gene, which is shown here, the transcription start site at plus one, and then the regulatory region extending back here. And we found that the hormone response element that was known to be bound by the mineralocorticoid receptor for aldosterone was in very close proximity to an EBOX response element which is the target sequence bound by clock proteins. So we used chromatin immunoprecipitation and amplified this region here using the primer shown here to look at whether or not PIR1 and the mineralocorticoid receptor were bound here at the same time. And those results are shown here. We used cortical collecting duct cells, and we treated those with either vehicle or aldosterone. This is our chromatin immunoprecipitation input, showing equal amounts of samples. Our positive control, we did an immunoprecipitation for RNA polymerase II, which is a marker of active transcription, and you can see that that signal is definitely increased with the aldosterone treatment. 
our negative control is here. And then we looked at the mineralocorticoid receptor on the left-hand side and PIR1 on the right-hand side. And when we quantitated this across several independent experiments, we found that the PIR1 signal increased, as did the MR signal, when these cells were treated with aldosterone. So this illustrates a very interesting connection, how these two homeostatic mechanisms, the circadian clock on one hand and the mineralocorticoid receptor and aldosterone signaling on the other hand, might interface to regulate these important sodium transport genes in the kidney. So to summarize some of this work, um, years of work from my lab, but also other labs that work in this area, I have two nephrons here that are side by side coming into a single collecting duct. So I wanna draw your attention first to the proximal tubule cell up here at the top where NHE3 is located on the apical membrane of these cells where it brings sodium in from the filtrate and it can then be transported back to the blood through the action of the sodium potassium ATPase on the basolateral membrane. So we and others have shown that NHE3 and also the sodium glucose transporter are regulated by this clock mechanism. And one of the things I find very exciting about working in this area as I alluded to earlier, Dr. Hoganesh is, is a genomics um, researcher and and so he found in this unbiased approach that NHE3 was a clock target gene in the kidney. Um, this group led by Hitoshi Okamura um, back in 2005 looked at NHE3 protein expression at different time points and found that it varied with the clock. And then in my lab in an independent study, we also found that NHE3 was regulated by this mechanism. So multiple different labs over about a 10 to 12 year period of time all very consistently finding that this mechanism of clock regulation of transcription is tied to rhythms and renal function. So moving on down um, to another cell type in the thick ascending limb, um, some, uh, another group here over in, in France showed in a PLOS one paper that ROMK and NKCC2, other transporters um, important in potassium regulation, are subject to this mechanism of regulation. And then moving on to the distal convoluted tubule in work that I didn't have time to share with you today, uh, we showed that the sodium chloride co-transporter, which is the target of the very commonly used antihypertensive hydrochlorothiazide, is also regulated by this mechanism. We've also done a lot of work in cortical collecting duct cells, and I've mentioned that briefly with the regulation of alpha enac by the mineralocorticoid receptor and PIR1. So taken together, all of these data suggest that molecular gene regulation really does contribute to circadian rhythms in renal physiology. And this has implications for the regulation of renal function and blood pressure. So I wanna move on now to the pathophysiology portion of my clock and I, uh, of my talk. <laughs> no pun intended, um, and I would like to highlight the very beautiful work of Tammy Martino that was done several years ago, and they use this tau mutant hamster, and these hamster, hamsters have a mutation in their casein kinase, which regulates the clock proteins and how they enter into the nucleus, and these hamsters are kept on a normal 24-hour cycle along with the rest of the animal facility, but their own inherent rhythm is actually a 22-hour cycle. So when they're forced onto that 24-hour cycle, they exhibit a cardiorenal phenotype. And you can see that here if we look just at the kidney. So these are wild-type hamsters on the right showing normal histology, normal um, glomerular architecture. And in the tau mutant hamsters on this 24-hour cycle, you can see dilated tubules, you can see fibrosis, and evidence of glomerular ischemia. So these histological slides illustrate the effects of, of a broken clock, if you will, on kidney anatomy. And one of the really fascinating things about this study is that they could rescue this phenotype simply by manipulating the light-dark cycle. So they move those animals onto a 22-hour cycle, which is what their inherent rhythm was. They restored the longevity of those animals, and they reverted this cardiorenal phenotype. So very interesting illustration here of how a broken clock can cause pathophysiology in the kidney. And then moving on to some work done by Dmitry Fursov and colleagues that was published in the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology in 2012, we can look at the effect of clock disruption on global patterns of gene expression. And so in this heat map shown here, we have wild-type mice on the left and a clock gene knockout on the right. Each column is a time point done in duplicate going over the 24-hour cycle. 
and every row is a gene, and these genes have been arranged by the time, the circadian time, at which their expression peaks. So in the wild-type animals on the left-hand side, you can see this nice sort of wave pattern of gene expression, very orderly compared to the clock knockout on the right-hand side, which is very clearly disrupted relative to the wild-type animals. And so it's interesting to note that at the global organism uh, phenotype level, these animals have a diabetic phenotype. They show dysregulated rhythms and renal function, and they also have reduced blood pressure. So again, this link between disordered gene regulation and pathophysiology. So going back now into Dr. Hoganesh's database, um, we were interested in some of the pathways related to disease processes. So in this reactome figure, again, where we're looking at genes in this pathway over time related to their expression, I was interested to see that this gene, HSPA5, appears to be a clock-regulated gene. This is a heat shock protein that functions in ER stress, and it has previously been linked to kidney function in human GWAS studies, and it has also been linked to the diabetic phenotype um, that occurs with cellular damage due to ER stress. So using our independent batch of um, samples, we wanted to compare the expression seen in the Hoganesh study, which is illustrated here, expression lower during the rest phase and higher during the active phase. I've pointed out here the noon and midnight, and if we look at the relative expression levels, this is about a 2.5-fold difference. In my lab, again, in an independent set of animals, comparing the noon and midnight time points with real-time PCR, 100% expression set here at midnight, we see about a 2.5-fold reduction in expression. So is this related to the pathophysiology of this phenotype? Well, again, I went back to Dmitry Fursov's database to look at the expression of HSPA5 in his diabetic animals. And the expression peak of HSPA5 is shifted by about three and a half hours in the clock knockout compared to the wild-type mouse. So whether or not this um, truly underpins some of the disease phenotype remains to be seen, but it's very intriguing to see this disrupted gene regulation in this animal model of a pathophysiological state. So to summarize, today I've shown you that renal function is rhythmic, and although I focused on the human data, all of those studies have been shown to be true in mice as well, and that circadian disruption is likely associated with kidney disease. And one of the things that I like to tell people, since I, um, like um, Dr. Uh, Rodrigo shared, I happened into the field of circadian biology by accident because we found that Pier 1 was regulated by a hormone we were interested in. Uh, but one of the things that's changed in my life since I started working in this field are my own sleep patterns. So due to some of the data that I've shown you today, um, but please don't tell my department chair, I do tend to sleep more than I used to. So the physiology of renal rhythms. I've shown you that um, there's coordinate regulation of sodium transport genes by Pier 1 in the clock, and that there's also this role for nuclear receptors. And in terms of the pathophysiology of renal rhythms, or when clock genes go bad, we've seen that the dysregulation of clock control genes um, is associated with kidney disease and cardiovascular function. And those mechanistic studies uh, are still being done, and I think it's a very exciting area um, to pay attention to. So with that, I'd like to thank the members of my laboratory. Um, Thomas Chang is my lab manager and our resident night owl, so we're all, I'm always very grateful to him. Um, Kristen Solosinski, a graduate student in my lab. Our collaborators on the sodium transport work and Dr. Hoganesh on the gene regulation studies. Our other collaborators at the University of Florida and our support here. I want to thank you for your attention. I'm going to leave it with this slide, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, we can take a few questions.